symbol of our faith and community with a psalm from the Bible, number 133. How rare it is, how lovely this fellowship of those who meet together. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Walsh, our guest speaker today. And I think for most of you, Peter needs no introduction since he's here at church uh, most Sundays singing in the choir. And we've had the great pleasure of hearing you recite your poetry a number of times uh, in the last uh, few years. Uh, Peter's been a member of USG since uh, 1973, so we're doing the math of 45 years, so good, good uh, long stretch. So welcome, Peter, and we're, we're glad to have you here with us this morning. Good morning. I'm honored to be asked by Kent Mathias to read some of my poems to you this morning and grateful to you for being here to listen to them. Some of you may wish to read the printed poems uh, that I have uh, had distributed with the order of service. There are extras over here if you don't have them. Um, all except one of the poems that I will read today were chosen from those written during the past year when I participated in a poetry workshop by a scholar of poetry, Susan Weston, to whom I owe a debt of gratitude. I see she has honored me with her presence here today. Thank you, Susan. And the first and sometimes only person with whom I share my poems is my wife of 60 years, Marnie, who helps me with wise and perceptive insights for which I'm extremely grateful. The poems I shall read are grouped under the categories of physics, math, and memory. I'm taking the liberty of dedicating this service to two good friends and valued members of this congregation, Kathy Sheeter Bonanno and David Bonanno. She is superb poet and he editor of the American Poetry Review. When one reaches my age in life, that of an elder as designated by Jerry Whelan, one expects to lose close friends to death. However, Kathy and David were lost to us far too young. The first poem I will read is entitled, What the Snowflakes Said, and is dedicated to Kathy and David. The snowflakes came early this year each one bearing a burden, heavier and more transitory than a premonition spoken in unison. Ask not for whom the black robed scyther comes, he comes for you and for every one of us in the end. It is said that each snowflake is unique and fleeting, like a deja vu saying together, lately the scyther has been coming too often, almost once a week, according to our dead reckoning. And now he has displayed the extraordinary lack of grace to come too early for two of us. One, the soul of laughter, the paragon of wisdom, the quintessence of wordplay. The other, the epitome of modesty, the apotheosis of drollery, the maven of poetry. The snowflakes rest on the black robe of the cider, and there melt and die. Another person we have lost this year is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist, Stephen Hawking, who died at the age of 76 on March 11, 2018, otherwise known as Pi Day. Since the abbreviation of March 11 is 3.11, a rough approximation of the number pi, an irrational number which has recently been calculated to 2.7 trillion digits. The poem is entitled Hawking. Born 300 years to the day after Galileo died, he sent out his mind and math to frisk the mist of the cosmos and sent out his ersatz voices as queries to the ears of space. There he found the black holes that ate everything in sight except for the kitchen sink, 
which was busy washing dishes while he was doing wheelies at bone break speed in intergalactic space, asking the question, do black holes explode to emit particles such as photons, neutrinos, electrons, and their evil twins, the positrons, and answering yes in math so far beyond the can of my poor mind to comprehend that in the end he died on Pi Day 139 years after Einstein's birth, but will keep on living as long as we keep calculating Pi. The next poem focuses on someone who fails to see the relationship between global warming and man's activity here on Earth. It is entitled Eclipse. This trolley is on a one-way track while the beetle's running in circles and a solar eclipse is on its way. So where do we go from here with the earth turning and warming and the oceans invading the land? When it's raining, it's not a good day for viewing the eclipse, but it's a good day for ducks and beavers who, like him, have no problem so far with global warming. They'll paddle around while he is driving and chipping and putting through the hard facts that disprove his denial. Don't confuse me with the facts, he says. My mind is made up. His mind is on a one-way track, like the trolley, that runs in circles, like the beetle. And it's stopped raining now, so he says, I can stare at the sun as long as I want without fear of going blind since he is already blind and deaf to boot. The next group of poems I will read consists of three fables, one about the creation of light, one about the underworld, and one about a story about an ugly man. All three poems deal a form of address, O oh, Best Beloved, used by Rudyard Kipling in his Just So stories. First, the fable about light. The physical basis of light is somewhat mysterious since it has been shown that light is mediated by photons that are a hybrid consisting partly of wave and partly of particle. Light travels at a rate of 186,000 miles per second and all the experimental data and theoretical concepts available indicate that nothing can travel faster. This is the universal speed limit. The poem is <coughs> entitled Light Fable. The flux of light that shines under my door illuminates the night with photons that refuse to be extinguished as they travel through space at the speed enacted by the physicist in chief, since she said, let there be light, and there was light that was spawned by a wave copulating with a particle to, to make an irrepressible shining bit ripple that permeates the darkness of the cosmos. And this, O oh best beloved, is the fable, the fable about the creation of light. The story is told by physics, quantum mechanics, and cosmology, and those told by mythology are equal, equally fascinating to me as subjects for poetic expression. The next poem I will read contains mythological deities that inhabit the underworld, an interesting place to visit to discover truths about our own lives. The title of the poem contains the word kathonic, which means concerning, belonging to, or inhabiting the underworld. The title of the poem is Chthonic Deities. Driven by my curiosity, I dive deep into the loamy earth in search of guides like Dante, who in turn was led by Virgil, or Lucifer, the morning star, 
who fell to rule the underworld together with Hades and his adoring consort Persephone. Failing these, I search out the woodchuck, groundhog, whistle pig, or the ectothermic naked mole rat, sand puppy, who spends its entire life underground, impervious to pain and cold, unlike spelunkers who share the bat's domain with other cave dwellers among stalactites and stalagmites, standing guard with Cerberus and all the other Chthonic deities who rule over all those buried in the earth. Remember Viper Bitten Eurydice, so missed by her loving husband Orpheus, that he played his lyre with such poignancy that Persephone and Hades gave him leave to lead her back to the land of the living as long as he refrained from looking backwards to assure himself that she still followed him. Alas, the love struck doubting Orpheus turned to gaze upon her face and she was swept back into the underworld forever. Let this be a lesson, O oh best beloved. Never think you can outfox Chthonic deities. The third poem of this section is written in the form of a prose poem recounting a story I wrote after reading a novel entitled The Storyteller by Mario Vargas Llosa. It is entitled The Ugly One. Allow me to introduce myself, O oh best beloved. I am Cypher, and I am here to tell you a story about my friend, Persona Fea, the Ugly One, or Feo for short, who lived in the Peruvian jungle in the headwaters of the Amazon, completely alone, since he had been excommunicated from his kith and his kin on account of a hideous birthmark that discolored and deformed his entire face making him the ugliest man alive, who miraculously had acquired all upon his own the gift of language, the good nature of a saint, the loving kindness of a god, the cultural wisdom of a philosopher, the medicinal knowledge of a shaman, the love of music, and the music of love. His people had sent him out into the jungle with nothing but a loincloth and his name, his ugliness. One evening, after the sun had gone down, we were sitting around the campfire telling stories when we were visited by that most venomous of pit vipers, the Fair de Lance, renowned for its aggressive pursuit of banana harvesters who had only 30 minutes of life remaining after having been bitten by the snake. Calling upon his deep self-learned knowledge of all wild things, Pharaoh cast a spell upon the serpent who immediately became our ally and transformed its venom into a beneficent potion that made all envenomed people love one another and askew xenophobia. So Pharaoh sent out the serpent to travel about the world, inf infecting all mankind. And that, O oh best beloved, is the true story of how my friend Pharaoh ended all hatred and all warfare upon the face of the earth. Would that it were true. The next grouping of poems encompasses the metaphorical qualities of animals that can enrich our lives. The first of these recounts an experience Marnie and I had at, Martha's, at uh, Morris Arboretum last autumn. It is annotated, Eli, Eli, Lama Savaltani, the last words of the crucified Jesus, liter literally translated as my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is entitled The Doe. Suddenly, from out of nowhere, she leaped, 
from out of panic, freaked by the shrieking and running and chasing of small children. With grace, she traced an, a perfect, an upward perfect arc over a blind fence made of plastic wire, then, like a dancer, coiled to leap again. Her hind legs became enmeshed in the wire fence, hidden like a trap in the coppice, where she leaped and leaped with her hindquarters refusing to obey, being paralyzed as a consequence of her broken spine, which combined with fear put her into shock. She then succumbed to nature's exhortation by yielding up her breath of life and giving up her body to be consumed as venison. The next poem is entitled Secrets. Strider, our calico cat, went missing the day we put down the new bathroom floor until we heard her far plaintive mewling. There are secrets that need to be told lest they be revealed as the stench of death. So we ripped up the floor to free the cat. Other secrets are meant to be buried, like confessions whispered in a priest's ear. The secrets we fail to tell each other. The secrets I can't even tell myself. Or the cryptic crux of the cipher code but the curiosity of the cat must be assuaged for secrets such as these. The silence of the owl in flight. The secrets hidden in our genes. What happened before the Big Bang? And other secrets mankind might wish to know. The next poem I'd like to read is a pantoum, a melee verse form, which has a series of prescribed repeating lines. It is composed as a series of quatrains. The first and fourth lines of each stanza are repeated as the first and third of the following stanza. Sorry, the second and fourth of the lines of each stanza are repeated as the first and third of the following stanza. The pattern continues for any number of stanzas in this poem 12, except for the final stanza, which differs in the repeating pattern. I won't go into any more detail for fear of confusing you and me both, but you will understand, hopefully, the effect upon the reader of this recurring pattern when you hear and see the poem entitled Transformation. In that shimmering country of the northern lights, I met a dapple gray quarter horse mare called Spooks, aptly named because she was wont to see ghosts. From the whites of her eyes, she saw a doppelganger leaping. My dapple gray quarter horse mare called Spooks one sun-drenched summer morning in the woods, from the whites of her eyes, saw a doppelganger leaping from the bush to mount her from the right side. On a sun-drenched summer morning in the woods, you can turn a day off into an off day by leaping from the bush to mount a horse from the wrong side. She rematerialized 10 feet to the left you can turn an off day into a day off by leaping. It's all a matter of how you order things in life. She rematerialized 10 feet to the left, leaving her luckless rider on the ground. It's all a matter of how you order things in life and whether you take time enough or space to leave the luckless rider on the ground by defying Newton's law of momentum. There is not time enough nor space to climb as high as space or run as fast as time or ever to defy Newton's law of momentum. The stable master was a salty old dog 
Wayne Slocum. To climb as high as space or run as fast as time, that was the magic she tried to conjure up. The stable master, a salty old dog, Wayne Slocum, he told me the first rule of horse breaking. That was the magic he tried to conjure up, to impose his will on hers and get her attention. He told me the first rule of horse breaking, smash a whiskey bottle full of warm water on her head, to impose his will on hers and get her attention. That was the purpose, transformation, redemption. Smash a whiskey bottle full of warm water on her head. It would feel like blood flowing and get her attention. That was the purpose, transformation, redemption. Instead, I took a gentler tack with her. It would feel like blood flowing and get her attention. I whispered love poems in her laid back ears. Indeed, I took a gentler tack with her. We are all at war with ourselves and each other. I whispered love poems in her pricked up ears. Then we were with one another and at war with none. We were once at war with ourselves and each other and aptly named because we were wont to see ghosts. Then we were with one another and at war with none in that simmering, shimmering country of the Northern Lights. The next poem I shall read is addressed to my mother after she died. I believe many of us have had the experience of wishing we could ask questions of a deceased loved one that illuminate experiences of shared interest. This poem is entitled, I Never Saw You. I never saw you growing up in the wood frame house on Elm Street with the wood stove, hand pump, pedal powered sewing machine. Never saw you walking your little sister Viv to school. Never saw you in your father's Model T driving out to Fairy Lake for a swim in the hot, hot, dry, dry Sauk Center summer. Never saw you ice skating on the frozen skin of Sauk Lake. Never saw you take visiting relatives to the Methodist Church for your mother or the Catholic Church for your father. Never saw you milking the cows with Uncle Johnny, Uncle Elmer, Uncle Oscar, or churning the skimmed sweet cream into butter in the shade of the back porch. Never saw you caring for your bedridden grandma mumbling incoherently and paralytic. Never saw you standing next to Sinclair Lewis, who wrote Main Street about your hometown as he pat patted you on the backside. He'd never get away with that now. Never saw you leave your hometown forever to put on your nurse's uniform I never saw you wear. Never saw you meet the handsome English surgeon who taught you to sip martinis, smoke cigarettes, and spawn your only child, who never will again hear you tell the stories I so urgently want to hear. Some time ago, I retired from my position for 40 years on the faculty at Temple University School of Medicine, caring for patients carrying out laboratory research and teaching. The poem I will read is what is, what is referred to as a list poem, which is a poem that simply lists concrete images in a certain category. In this instance, the category is defined in the, line, in the title of the poem, which is what I left behind. First, the people in the medical school and in the hospital where my stethoscope lived in the pocket of my white coat or around my neck to peer into the heart of the patient and where my ophthalmoscope was at the ready 
to listen to the stories in the eyes of the ill. My colleagues in the laboratory that was built to my blueprints showed the lab benches and desks where each secretary, research scientist, postdoc, graduate student, and technician would do the work that showed how each protein did its tiny task. The conference room where we wrestled with the facts to make the next experiment. The walls of my office lined with textbooks. The unblinking eye of my computer twisting and turning the backbones of our favorite proteins and transforming these structures into grant applications and published papers. Then one day our building was picked for demolition and we were told to clean out the lab so that charges could be placed at every joint in the building's brittle bones that collapsed in one fell swoop. Since that day, I have awakened every day from a dream about the people and myself working in the lab or in the hospital as if what I left behind still existed. The last poem I will read is, What's a Poem? I am skating rather precariously on the sharp edge of a metaphor to define the nature of a poem and where the line should be broken or drawn and how it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, do wah, do wah, do wah, do wah, like a song sung, bell rung, lyric swung, lyre strung, cat got your tongue, or didn't you hear my question? What's a poem? Is it or isn't it? You decide.